Special coverage on KCPT of the Greater Kansas City Chamber's Big Five initiatives is funded by Burns and McDonnell, with additional financial support from Swope Community Enterprises, and by Principal funding for The Local Show, provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you. If you were asked to come up with five ideas to improve Kansas City, what would you pick? Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes, and we're on location this week at Union Station, which is the home of Science City, as well as restaurants and theaters, and also the home of the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, which in the fall of 2011 came up with five big ideas to move the Metro forward. But during that period of time, though, they not only wanted to come up with five big ideas, not only just to talk about it, but to act upon it as well. But more than a year has passed since then. What happened to those ideas? This hour, we find out as we convene an hour-long conversation, a status report on the Big Five. This year, the Chamber is going to establish our five big goals for Kansas City. Five big ideas represent a consensus of how we can improve both our lives and our competitiveness. Visualize for a moment, you are the leader of our entire metro. Yes, you are in charge. We knew we couldn't take on every good idea in Kansas City, but we knew we could take on some. Pick five ideas that were transformative, that would make a difference. My goal is to take this to the next level. Really make our mark, not just on the region and the country, but on the world. Why is the Big Five so important? Because it points to things that we in Kansas City are gonna do, and it points to what we should be doing in America today, which is planning our future. They didn't wanna just talk about five ideas, Randy. They wanted to make five things happen that would make a difference in the Metro. And after months of task force, and meetings and shrinking down its list from close to 200 big ideas, they decided to roll up their sleeves and propose relocating the UMKC Conservatory of Music and Dance to downtown, develop a strategic plan to improve urban neighborhoods, make Kansas City a nationally recognized center for medical research, hold a world symposium on animal health, and transform Kansas City into America's most entrepreneurial city. Why is this big five going to be any different than things we've heard in the past? We need to get things moving in this community. We are competing both globally and nationally. We'll take a very systematic and frankly a very business-like approach to this. We identified a champion, a doer for each one of the ideas, and every one of the champions is a person who has the word failure nowhere on his resume. These are people who know how to get things done. I believe that nothing short of the long-term economic health and vitality is at risk here if we don't embrace tomorrow's entrepreneurs today. And our total commitment is to work on transforming the east side of Kansas City. Think of Kansas City Cures. That's really what this is all about. For us to be the convener of the first international symposium on animal health, the goal is to establish a sophisticated performing arts space for higher education. This is all about doing what is best for our students, for the university, and also for Kansas City. This hour, you'll have a chance to meet those big five leaders. But first, I want you to introduce you to what we're calling our sage think tank of leaders. They are Chamber CEO Jim Heater, the head of Burns and McDonald, Greg Graves, who chaired the chamber when it launched the big five, and current chamber chair, Russ Welsh, who leads the Polsonelli Sugar Law Firm. Jim, can you quickly connect the dots with us, first of all? Why did we need a big five, period? Why do we need this? 
Well, Nick, businesses have plans, organizations have plans, municipal governments have plans, but there was no plan for Big KC, and we wanted to adopt an action plan to get some big things done for Big KC. But why five, Greg Graves? Couldn't it just be one? Would not be much easier, wouldn't it? Come on. One would be easier. <laughs> but, you know, uh, Nick, I think it goes back to all of us have things on our bucket list, right? I want to do a triathlon. I want to be interviewed by Nick Haynes on public television. <laughs> Big, <laughs> audacious goals. It needed to be enough to really challenge us, but just the right number so we could make sure we got them done. Now, Russ Welch, you're now the new chair. I mean, you inherited this. I mean, has the chamber bitten off more than it can chew with this? I don't think so, Nick. Uh, we did inherit this, but we were part of the process that led to the Big Five. And myself, Roshan Paris, Terry Dunn and, and Ralph Reed, who will follow me as chairs, all committed to continue the Big Five, and, and we're very pleased and willingly do so. Well, in no ranked order, idea number one is to relocate the UMKC Conservatory of Music and Dance downtown. Now, that has since been expanded to include most of the arts programs at UMKC. Now, but most of us don't really understand what the UMKC Conservatory of Dance and Music even is, even though it's been part of Kansas City's cultural life for over 100 years. In a sense, the conservatory teaches 15,000 music and dance lessons a year. As its dean, Peter Witte compares it to work done in the kitchen to prepare a great meal for the dining room. This facility was built when we had 300 students or so at the conservatory. We're now at 527, and we're simply bursting at the seams. Let's see some seams. Absolutely. So this is one of our piano practice rooms, and it's cozy. Let's do the math here. Seven foot piano, six foot room. So the challenge in each of the rooms is pretty significant. And then there's the challenge that we simply don't have enough of the rooms. Getting a practice room here at the conservatory is a little bit like getting an apartment in Manhattan. A lot of magic happens here. This is Bobby Watson's office. For Bobby, I think the opportunity to come back to Kansas City uh, was the right opportunity at the right time. The challenge was, in order to make a space for Bobby, we needed to take down a wall and then lose two practice rooms. He gets to come back to this. Well, yeah. It's what we have, and we're making it work. And here we have one of our dance studios. And we have two, we really should have four. This is where we're placing all of our costumes and all of the things that people don't think are part of uh, making a production possible. And every square inch is taken up. For years now, UMKC's White Recital Hall has been the place for students to formally reveal the skills they've developed. But the arrival of a world-class performance hall some five miles away is beginning to change the game and Peter Witte has been quick to seize the opportunity. We have been challenged for quite some time seeking a solution for space. The thing that is possible, though, is if you turn a problem sideways, it can become an opportunity. In its first year, Ellsberg Hall has hosted groups from the conservatory playing everything from the Carmina Burana to the Gates Barbecue Suite. For students and faculty, the idea of a spacious new home just down the street from such an amazing facility is hard to resist. It's a, one of the coolest venues I've ever been in. It's beautiful, the acoustics are wonderful. Having played there, you want to contribute to the, the greatness of the place. If it's our conservatory, it's closer to, to that building, you know, then we have linked everything. And joining us now is the Big Five champion for the UMKC arts move to downtown, the chancellor of UMKC, Leo Morton. Have the students started packing their suitcases already to move downtown? What's the status of this project, well, Chancellor? We'd love to pack right now, but we've got a little work to do. Primarily, it's uh, to raise the funds to make this happen. Now, there was an editorial in the Kansas City Star the first week of January that said that was the elusive factor. It was going to cost between 50 and $80 million to make this project a reality. And finding the funders for this, that was the issue. 
Right. The, in fact, um, as we looked at programs for all of the arts venues that uh, you mentioned, um, the total cost would be closer to $270 million when it's built out in, say, 20 years. But phase one would start with the Conservatory of Music and Dance, and that has a price tag of $88 million before you include things like um, land acquisition costs, parking, housing. Now, depending on the uh, location, those issues could disappear. Now, originally when we spoke, this was earlier in the year right. uh, of last year, uh, right. we were talking about three different locations for this. Right. Two in the Crossroads area, and right. one atop the parking garage next to the Marriott Hotel right. in the Barney Alice Plaza area. Yes. Are you, have you narrowed the site of where this potentially could be? I believe we have narrowed that to um, uh, the two preferred sites are closest to the Kauffman Performing Arts Center. So it would be south and, the south and west location or the location east of the Performing Arts Center. Now some people will be looking at this at home for the first time and they'll see this and think, well, UMKC is still only a, just a, down the road yes. from, from the Kauffman Center for the Performing Arts. Can't your students still just go a few miles up the road and still experience all of these fa this fabulous new performing arts space without moving at all from your current campus? Well, that's possible, but uh, last year in March, we took a trip to uh, New York to visit with um, uh, Juilliard. And uh, Joseph Polisi, who is the head of Juilliard and has been for the last 26 years, had the opportunity to show us what it can mean when you have a venue like that close to a place like the Kauffman Center for the Performing Arts because they're right there at Lincoln Center. So what this allows us to do is position ourselves to be extremely attractive to the best faculty in the nation as well as the best talent locally and, ac and around the world. Let me ask our think tank here, our sage think tank, what do you think this would do economically to the city if the arts programs at UMKC were to move downtown? You know, Nick, right. one of the things that Jim and I did when we had our 25 No Bad Ideas meetings from all over the city, one of the things we noticed was there was one subject that came up every time, whether we were in South Johnson County, up by the airport, or right here in the urban core, how do we take UMKC from being a great school to a great urban university? And we want this to be the metropolitan areas, big Kansas cities, big five, there's not one person who doesn't think by moving UMKC forward and in a big way. Because keeping it on campus and making it a little better, that's a great example of a small five. We're looking for a big five. And can you imagine, what does downtown need? It needs more people, it needs fun people, it needs people who spend money. I'm thinking 500 college kids, now that makes for a better downtown. Okay, so you said, all of, you said all of these things, you said all of these things, but the challenge again is, is the money. We, so yes. how, how long do you keep going with this project then, Chancellor? Well, we're, look, once we put together the three studies, we had what we needed to go back to potential donors. I call them investors. So we, we, we spoke with them initially to see which, what questions they would have. Once we got those, we did the studies. Now we've been back to talk to at least eight. Uh, so far, we've had some support. We've only had two no's, but the, the jury is still out uh, with most of them. We expect to hear sometime soon. Questions for Chancellor Leo Morton. Any questions on this particular big five item from our audience? What would the impact of moving the uh moving downtown be on the campus down close to the plaza? Right, well, that was, in fact, that was one of the questions our potential investors had. Uh, the notion was that you have these great art students who are taking classes with guys like me who are engineers. And the question is, can, they, so can, can the campus survive well and still continue to have the influence over all of those other disciplines with the divided campus? And the answer is we can. And, and that's because our art students are not taking a lot of courses today with uh, students in other disciplines because they are there to develop their professional skills. So they take very few courses with others. The main thing here is this. Our students would still continue to perform on the campus. That's where the interaction between the rest of the campus and our art students takes place. The space we're talking about is what Dean Witte calls kitchen space. 
It's where the students develop their talents. Not many people see that space. That's, but that's what we need to have in order to really increase our capacity and uh, to develop the kind of talent that we are trying to develop. Thank you Thank very you. much indeed. Any other questions for the Chancellor? Leo Morton, yes. thank you very much indeed for being with us. Next up, big idea number two. People have lamented why so little progress, so little improvement and economic development has happened east of Troost Avenue, what has been the symbolic geographic racial divide in the city. Now the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce has agreed to throw its entire weight and influence behind changing that. The Chamber has picked the Troost Corridor for unprecedented focus and civic attention. Today is a big day, a big day for Big KC and for the Chamber's Big Five. And our total commitment is to work on transforming the east side of Kansas City. Anybody here give me a drum roll? I have never seen such a broad spectrum of support to help our community. We've got business, civic, philanthropic leadership here. So no more talk, no more lamenting, no more commiserating. It's now time to kind of roll the sleeves up, pick up some hammers, some tent, some some nails, some saws, and other tools, and let's get something done. Please welcome to the podium the new executive director of Urban Neighborhood Initiatives, Diane Cleaver, and the chair of the board, Mark Jorgensen, president and CEO of U.S. Bank in Kansas City. Big idea number two. So what have you done? We've heard all about this, the Truce Corridor now. We've been busy in the latter part of 2011 and all of 2012 in planning and planning uh, to a great uh, extent with all of our neighborhood partners, and we consider them partners. Uh, Diane's been uh, in, uh, intimately involved in that as well. I'll let her speak. Yeah, I'm not sure where we were last time we spoke, but you know, we, f we formed a 501c3, a different uh, UNI, Urban Neighborhood Initiative organization, to move this forward. Uh, we have a great board, uh, one of our major assets, and uh, we have hired full-time staff, as Mark alluded to, and we have continued to um, fine-tune our action agenda in partnership with our neighborhoods, which we know is the only way it's going to be successful. So we've had meetings after meeting after meeting. Improving the health, the job, and education opportunities for neighborhoods generally around Troost Avenue, US 71 between 22nd and 52nd streets was the sort of mandate here. So let's talk about those. Um, how about health? How is that going to improve as a result of what you're doing on the Truce Corridor there? Well, I think what you'll be hearing from us in the not too distant future are some um, measurable outcome objectives and some indicators that we'll be checking along the way. We're not ready to tell you exactly what those are yet, but to a great extent we're talking about uh, neighborhood and community health and safety. Uh, and there are many kinds of things that we know we can do to make, uh, to make that happen. Uh, things around reducing crime, uh, neighborhood uh, block watches, uh, we believe increasing, the, and the neighborhoods have said, uh, making them more digitally literate is a way to increase the safety of their neighborhoods. So we have a number of ideas that we're going to line up in a prioritized way to make that happen, and then we're going to lay out some measures for it. I mentioned a couple things too, Nick. On the, um, the health side, fresh food corridor is a name we'd like to see attached to this particular area. We've already planted, been involved in planting orchards. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, in installing a number of different gardens throughout the, uh, the catchment area. In addition, as you uh, I'm sure well know, John Bluford is seeking to establish a grocery store that's going to have a lot more healthy choices. On the digital side, uh, we met last week with a company. We can't announce things yet, but it's a very promising partnership with a technology company that everybody in this room knows and I'm really excited about what we can do there in terms of access to technology for the folks again in the UNI uh, catchment area. Some of the skepticism about this particular effort in the general media has been you know what needs to happen here is spurring jobs in this area. What can you report to us today about your efforts in terms of helping to increase jobs in the area that you're trying to help? 
we're looking at what we can do to bring new employers to the area. We're looking at what we can do to match up individuals living in the area with existing jobs, what we can do to accelerate that pathway and make people more ready to take those jobs, make those employers more open and accessible to those individuals. Um, so we're looking at placing new businesses and connecting and job training. We're looking at all of those things. One of the concerns has also come out is, well, we've heard it all before. People wanting to help this area. It's never happened. What, what's going to be different about this? What is different about this effort versus <coughs> other efforts to try and help the Truce Corridor? One thing I would say <clears throat> is it's very important to recognize that a lot has happened in this area. And uh, part of what we want to do as you and I is tell that story. A lot of progress has been made in that area, but that's not what you hear about the area. There's been housing development. There's been a reduction in crime. There have been new businesses, new small businesses to come in. Many things that the neighborhood residents have worked on over the years. So things have been happening. We believe that we can be a partner and an accelerator to really move that forward in a, in a big five kind of way. The other thing that I think is critically important is the individuals around the table at UNI, the backing of the Chamber of Commerce in partnership with uh, you know, United Way, has really put its name out front. And the individuals sitting at the table, you could not ask for a, a better board, uh, those who make things happen, those who are committed uh, and, con and will continue to do so. So I think these are some of the things, and, and we understand that this has to be a long-term effort. Our, our board is telling ourselves over and over again, we can't be in here for two or three years and expect major change. We know we have to be committed for the long-term. That's what it will take to make these kinds of changes. Now, going to our sage think tank on this, I mean, when you came up with the big five ideas, you, you did pick these very complicated, systematic problem kind of areas. Uh, you didn't pick, you know, let's make Kansas City the city of fountains and things like that, or the youth soccer capital, which some people wanted, <laughs> or the youth, you know, youth um, sports capital of, of America. You picked these very complicated, hard kinds of subject areas, didn't you? Jim and I always yes. knew we were going to, but hook or crook, pick an urban core project because we do believe it's a moral imperative. But. I remember the meeting that we had, the No Bad Ideas meeting we had with a group of urban leaders. And it was people from these neighborhoods that said, what we don't need is another Saturday where 100 people show up and fix 10 roofs. We need opportunity in our lives to move ourselves forward. We need third grade reading efficiencies. We need the basics things that can make these neighborhoods come alive again. And it didn't come from anybody up here, it came from people in that group, and it, it's exactly what they want, and it is the most difficult of the big five at all, and it will, and it will take a long-term business approach to get it done. Russ? And it's the most transformational for Kansas City, and I'm proud of the chamber for picking an issue like this, or a, uh, an initiative like this that they could have passed on, the business community could have passed on and turned its back on, but they didn't, and uh, congratulations goes to those Greg Graves and Jim Heater, and of course, Diane and, and Mark, but we have to stick at it. This is a long-term uh, project, as Diane said. But long-term, I mean, this is going to be a decades-long project, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. 